So as we have established, Marco Anaros is not fighting a war in the way that will advance his victory, because victory is nothing short of solar domination. It's not like this is some third world government he can topple and start running himself. So a strategy to avoid engagement will be ineffectual to achieve that. But that fact doesn't change the issue that he does have a bunch of warships. Not enough to conquer, but enough to go after Pa's forces to make an example of her, even if he's risking diminishing the larger campaign against the Inners in the process. It's also a problem for the combined fleet, the unified Earth, Mars, and Fred Johnson OPA ships that are working against him. Because while Marco can't win, he can make sure that they can't defeat him either. His strategy will keep his forces alive for the time being, and rogue gunships are an intolerable situation for any authority that's attempting to maintain order. For Pa, Marco undermines her ability to do what the Free Navy was supposed to do, to use the stolen supplies to give to the Belt. She doesn't want to engage him, but the destruction of the Witch of Endor by Marco's forces means that the reverse isn't true. The combined fleet, meanwhile, is trying to develop a counterinsurgency strategy. Ceres may be a drain in pinning them in place, but protecting and caring for belters and treating stripping the station of supplies as a betrayal of the belter ethos is fighting that war. This is why Bobby and Fred are in vehement opposition over an agreement of non-aggression proposed by Pa, that her ships can travel safely in combined fleet territory without attack by either Marco or the Inners, and she'll give some of her stolen supplies to Ceres. Fred thinks that it's a mistake since Pa and Marco fighting each other weakens both of their enemies, but a big part of counterinsurgency is understanding that the people are themselves a power block and must be factored in. Since the OPA meeting that Fred wanted is having problems coalescing, bringing Pa over for supplies and intelligence offers a significant step swinging that block in favor of the combined fleet. Now they're the ones helping hungry belters survive while Marco robs them, murders the earth, and attacks his fellow belters trying to bring relief supplies. Holden recognizes this and thus says that the Rosinante will back this plan. But things go less than swimmingly. During the transfer, both sides are tense. Bobby is their gunner, and while she is a disciplined Martian Marine, she's been itching for a fight. Fred is deeply suspicious of this entire affair, including the possibility of a trap. Pa has just learned of a second ship loyal to her being destroyed by Marco, lured in by a false distress signal, and the entire group killed despite the captain's pleas to spare the crew. And then she finds out that the ship coming to meet them has James Holden on board, and the one opportunity to walk back Pa's revolt for the Free Navy. If she were to kill Holden, Marco's most despised enemy, well, that would be the ultimate gift to Marco, wouldn't it? He would probably welcome her back with open arms and announce to the whole solar system that this revolt was an elaborate deception to bait the trap. Was always part of the plan, Sasse. Instead, Ceres fires six missiles at her ship, and Pa can barely restrain her crew from attacking the Rosinante, because she saw Holden's own surprise and rage at this. Instead, she lets Holden shoot them down, avoiding the escalation that this had been intended to cause. Marco had no doubt left agents behind for this, although more than likely just to sabotage combined fleet ships. They were just taking advantage of the opportunity to do what Fred had wanted to do, let Marco's two enemies pound against each other. Avasarla is infuriated over the situation, since it legitimizes Pa's piracy, but Fred points out that Holden and the Rosinante are a valuable tool for them. In fact, they're instrumental in his plan. His meeting among the heads of the OPA faction is being put together, but it's going to be on Tycho, since there's no combined navy there. Some of these people have warrants, and he can't head there in an Earth or a Martian ship. They could sneak him over there, but it would send a better message if Fred arrived openly to show that Marco doesn't intimidate him, and doing so from an independent gunship would make that safer. Holden is fine with that, but he goes back to the point that he made in Nemesis games. Marco is doing what he's doing because the belt is backed into a corner. He's a symptom of a larger problem, and defeating the symptom isn't going to be enough. They don't just need to win the war. They need to win the peace. 
They need to show belters that they have a future, even with colony worlds that they themselves can never walk on. Unfortunately, Marco anticipates Fred's journey and intercepts. Discovering it's James Holden's ship as well, he calls Philip up to serve as the gunner. But he's unaware of how determined Bobby is to never let her team down again. Despite being outnumbered, Bobby is able to whittle it down so it's just them versus the Pella, and then is able to use their automated defenses to avoid their railgun shots to then fly into a cloud of PDC rounds. In fact, the only thing that likely prevented this from being the end of the Free Navy altogether was Holden's romanticism. When Bobby sends him a message to distract the other ship, Marco uses the opportunity, when Holden calls up, to show Philip to Holden without a word. A no doubt masculine boast that he had bedded Naomi first. But the effect on Holden is an inability not to see Naomi in Philip. So when Bobby has taken the Pella out of the fight and goes for the kill, Holden quietly disarms the missiles. Amos later notes this, and while he doesn't second-guess Holden's decision, he sees Holden as the righteous man after all, he does suggest that if they're not going to try to win a fight, it would be a good idea to stay out of it from now on. But the battle is not without casualty. We had seen Fred early from his own point of view and learned that he had health problems. The strain of the battle combined with the poor juice, the chemicals that are used to withstand high G-forces, that they were stuck with thanks to the war limiting their supplies, overwhelms Fred's already taxed system, and he dies. The crew of the Pella, though, don't know this, and the battle is considered a bitter defeat that should have left them dead. Philip stands up for the Free Navy when suggestions are that it's not living up to what was promised, but then he learns that his father has been blaming the defeat on him to everyone. This wasn't Marco's defeat. This was his son letting the Free Navy down. Outraged at the injustice, he confronts his father about this, but Marco's narcissism is so great it won't even bend before his own son. He not only tells Philip to his face this is all his fault, but that he's being childish for trying to pretend that it isn't, makes the boy say the words, I fucked up. But when the word eventually arrives that Fred died in the attack, it changes. The defeat belongs to Philip, but the victory belongs to Marco. It's this experience where the cracks in Philip's belief in his father are pried wide open, and he starts to consider that he's not the savior that everyone pretends he is. Pa learns that Marco's behavior is even worse than they had thought, as far as its effect on the belt goes. Sandrani is smuggled out to have a private conversation with Pa to let her know how bad things are, because no one is willing to listen. When this had all started, there had been a plan. They were going to start out by devastating the one biosphere that supports humans, yes. None of the worlds beyond the belt have a metabolism compatible with humans yet. So this was suicide, unless there was a plan of what to do afterwards. And there was. Create microecologies around the belt. But the work had to start immediately. Pa knows this, but has been viewing it all through the lens of we're falling behind our benchmarks and not we're spiraling towards extinction, which is Sandrani's point. The relief supply plan was supposed to be a stopgap measure while they got started. Sooner or later, those are going to run out, and the inefficiencies in the recycling system are going to catch up with them, and after that, that's the end of life in the belt. Their window is shrinking. Not the window to start, the window when they have to be functioning. And that's assuming that they had the supplies to get through that long. It's for this reason that she was willing to negotiate with Holden when he calls up needing a favor. Avasarla wants him to go ahead with that OPA meeting and briefs him on how to handle it diplomatically. Not to avoid conflict, but to avoid excessive concession. To know the balance between being strong and being capitulating. The deal with Pa is to give him legitimacy, to lie and say that she and Fred had called this meeting because they had a plan already in the works, so that the others would at least give Holden a fair hearing. It starts rough. Anderson Dawes arrives unannounced, and Holden refuses him admittance to ensure that he can't take control of the agenda. It's an embarrassment for Dawes, but when speaking to the woman who had tried to vouch for him, who had the seat at the table that he lacks, Dawes tells her to ignore it, 
and points out all the ways that Holden is a good horse to back in all of this. Anderson Dawes points to Holden's videos about belters to attempt to address the problems I referred to last time of seeing only some people as people and not just a category whose fate can be disregarded. Holden started filming belters doing belter things or telling belter stories about their experiences, humanizing them. While like many in the OPA, Dawes's protege takes this as an insult, Dawes points out that at least Holden is making an effort here. Not many inners were willing to do that. Maybe his videos are patronizing, but his misguided efforts are at least an attempt to raise up the belt instead of keeping it under the inner's boot. And given how much the Rosinante has flown for the belt rather than against it, this plan is worth pursuing. As he sits virtually alone at the memorial for Fred Johnson, Dawes can clearly see that his play with Marco was a mistake. He had known at the time that anyone else showing up with a fleet of ships would have been better. Marco was the worst possible choice for a belter symbol. Sure, he was good-looking, but he didn't have the disposition to match it. Dawes felt, though, that being in the inner circle could steer Marco and his cause in the right direction, that the politically inexperienced Marco could be easily used to create an even stronger OPA nation than they already had. Instead, Dawes can see that there was no steering an egomaniac who would rather burn the solar system than eat a single forkful of humble pie. As Naomi said, if no one else was left, Marco would declare victory, saying, we needed the apocalypse. And the way things are going, they just might have one. <laughs>